You're listening to Radio VR with me, Juliet Spare. For some young people, sexual violence rape is seen as a simple fact of everyday life. Sexual relations have been desensitised, leaving victims unable to recognise that they are being abused or exploited. A recent report by Britain's Office of the Children's Commissioner suggested that almost 2,500 children were known to be victims of child sexual exploitation by gangs and groups in the UK. London's Metropolitan Police estimated there to be 3,495 gangs in 2013, but that's a figure that some frontline charity workers say is woefully inaccurate. According to Gangsline, a frontline organisation working with gang members, it's actually more like 10,000, and it says the majority of rapes carried out by them are never reported to the police. Four years ago, campaigner Carleen Furman carried out a study on 352 girls associated with gangs in the UK. Her report concluded that sexual violence and exploitation are significant weapons used against females associated with or involved in gang violence. Four years later, a report published this year by the think tank Centre for Social Justice found that female gang members in their teens are being pressured to have sex with boys as young as 10 to initiate boys into gangs. It seems the issue of gang rape as a weapon of choice in the UK is lacking the attention it needs. Going back to September in 2013, a report, Unheard Voices, the sexual exploitation of Asian girls and women, published by the Muslim Women's Network UK, found that a different picture was being presented than the one in the British media and that the level of abuse of Asian girls in Britain has been missed. I'm joined in the studio by Aisha Nembard, author of How I Escaped a Girl Gang and Rolling in a London Girl Gang, herself as first-hand experience of living in a gang in London. Imran Chowdhury, a reporter from the newspaper Eastern Eye, and John Brown, head of strategy and development at the children's charity, the NSPCC. And joining us on the telephone is Nazmin Akhtar, vice chair of the Muslim Women's Network UK, who published the Unheard Voices report in September 2013. I said at the end there that it seems that the level of abuse of girls in gangs and from all different backgrounds and predominantly Asian backgrounds is being missed in the media. We'll start with you, Nasmin, seeing as that you were obviously involved in that report. What, what's happened since? Well, since publishing the report, we have seen better awareness in terms of understanding that there are Asian and other BME victims involved who are victims of sexual exploitation. However, we do still feel that there's still a lot more that needs to be done. And certainly we think that whilst the media has picked up on it a lot more than it previously had done, and certainly the reason why Unhugged for Voices even occurred was because we felt that the media was concentrating on only um, non BME victims and essentially turning it into a more of a race and religious matter, su- suggesting that victims of um, va- sexual exploitation were all white. And obviously, because of that reason, um, our concern was by doing, doing that and um, going through that dialogue, they were ignoring all the other victims of sexual exploita- exploitation. Who um, and not, not giving them a voice and making them even more vulnerable because essentially it meant they were fair game in the sense that even the perpetrators knew that no one would, and no one's looking for them, no one cares about them, and that's why we publish and had voices. And since then, I'd say there has been better awareness and a bit more media um, awareness on the topic, but we, we still think that there's much more that needs to be done and certainly much more than needs to be done on a community basis and even working with agencies such as the police and other social workers, etc. Thank you. Um, well, I'm going to turn now to uh, Imran Chowdhury, um, who, was, uh, who wrote this report that I saw in the Eastern Eye. Um, maybe then, you, you know, you're partly responsible for helping raise the issue um, within uh, different minorities in Britain. Um, what did your investigation find? Well, um, I kind of saw the report that you mentioned, um, the Centre for Social Justice Report, which they did in conjunction with the XLP charity. And uh, I kind of looked at it, and as a paper who kind of focuses and reports on the British Asian community, I thought what angle I could take it on. And, I've, and, I, and I have been told by caseworkers that Asian, Asian girls do actually take part in gangs and they are involved in gangs. And um, I thought this would be a, quite an interesting story for us. And um, I took it forward and I did some investigations and I got in contact uh, with an Asian girl in a gang through a caseworker. Um, it's it's quite shocking because, um, like um, has been mentioned, it is it's, it's a very hidden problem within the South Asian community in particular. 
Um, the concepts of honour and shame, it's very, very predominant in the South Asian community in particular. It's predominant in most cultures um, in the UK, but more so in the South Asian community. We see this in examples of the forced marriage statistics, which come out every year. The Forest Marriage Unit it talks about how, you know, South Asians, the Pakistani, um, Indian, Bangladeshi communities here in the UK top the list for forced marriage cases. Last year, they, you know, the, the government investigated 1,300 cases. They, they, they kind of helped and looked into. So it was a story, a good story for us. And what we found that, you know, because of this shame and honour that's predominant in, in, in Asian conservative families, girls find it much harder to confide in their families and to seek help from their families. Because how can, you know, they expect to get help from someone that's, that will essentially kill them for being in a relationship, you know, forget being sexually abused, just, just even being in a relationship and walking down the street with a, with a member of a opposite sex. And this is how serious it is. Um, so this is what we kind of found. It means that these victims um, aren't seeking help and that that's where there seems to be a gap. Yeah. And in Britain of young girls growing up from different backgrounds, trying to find some way of fitting into their existence Definitely. but with the constraint of a very conservative religion yeah but at the same time for various reasons fall victim to either joining a gang or being exploited and um, obviously we're also joined by uh, Aisha Nembard who um, was herself in a gang I guess if you could share your experience with us and then maybe give us some advice that you would say to one of these girls who is in this predicament um, my experience in a girl gang, it was purely, um, I, well, we started it off purely because um, we was getting attacked by another girl gang. Um, so, you know, any chance that they got to, you know, come and fight us. And it was like a rival, you know, ongoing thing for f five years throughout my school life. So we decided to, you know, join up as a unit to make... Um, ourselves feel safe because we wasn't feeling safe no one was protecting us um i think nowadays um involvement with girl gangs you know we was the girls perpetrating going out there and doing stuff ourselves nowadays you find that young girls are not doing the perpetrating themselves they're affiliated with boy gangs and that's where you get you know boys using girls you know that's where you get girls getting sexually abused by gang members and stuff like that because they're not actually doing they're not actually in a gang they're just affiliated with gang members and that's where you find out you know a lot of girls are getting used um, for holding you know um, knives um holding you know a, a crime weapon or even holding drugs for gang members um my advice for girls um um, in school, it all starts. Um, it, we work with as young as eight, you know, in primary schools. Um, so I reckon it all starts in, you know, school, you know, getting girls aware that, you know, how easy it is to slide into that sort of lifestyle, you know, making sure that a lot of schools that we work with don't like to... Um, you know, highlight their issues and they don't like to say, yeah, we have got a gang problem in our school. So I think it all starts with, you know, school, because um, that's where I started. And I think if the schools recognise their problems and not be embarrassed about their situation, they can help these young girls before it gets, you know, very bad. Maybe I'll turn to you then, John, really, um, from the NSPCC, because that was a question you asked me at the beginning. Is this a discussion about girl gangs or girl affiliation? And I think... Uh, Aisha kind of hit the nail on the head there with the the change in probably the girl gang structure within the UK and the sort of role that girls now have as an affiliation and then I guess it's the sexual violence that they are going through within their gangs. Having heard all the different reports, what's the NSPCC doing about it or what help can be given? Well, there's a number of things we're... we're trying to do about it um, and, and a number of things we think need to be done. Um, Prevention is absolutely critical and Aisha was talking there about schools and, and, and schools not being embarrassed or afraid or ill-equipped to begin to have these conversations and discussions with children from a really young age and that's what's absolutely critical. Um, uh, schools feel overloaded I think sometimes and a lot of teachers tell us we didn't come in to um, teach children and to talk to children about being sexually abused or about going into gangs. Uh, we came in to teach them maths or English or whatever it might be. So they feel ill-equipped and it's not, it goes right back to kind of teacher training, um, teacher selection 
and ensuring that their teachers do feel equipped to begin to have these conversations. That needs to be part of personal social health education from a really young age. We would say at the NSPCC from age five upwards. Um, and it needs to be part of what we like to refer to as relationships and sex education because it's the relationships bit that's absolutely critical. Obviously, children need to be taught about the biomechanics of sex and how babies are made, but underlying it all is about relationships and equity and respect. And I think that's, that's absolutely critical. And I think also in, in relation to prevention, we need to be really targeted and community-specific as well. So what is going to stop Asian girls in Bradford getting, from our experience anyway, at the NSPCC from getting drawn into um, being sexually exploited, sexually abused, um, and into a gang environment is potentially different to what is going to stop an, a, a girl from an African Caribbean background getting drawn into, you know, um, for, from a, a different culture and a different community, and that's going to be different from. Uh, a, a, a girl from a white community getting drawn into either a gang environment or a group environment where they're going to be sexually abused and exploited. There are some cross-cutting themes in terms of it being difficult to talk about, in terms of sex and sexual violence being used as a, a, a weapon of power and domination, and the excitement as well. And, and I think we shouldn't be afraid to talk about that. It's exciting. That's why girls get drawn into that, that into this. That's why boys get drawn into it. Fast cars, money, um, you know, status, all those sort of things. And there, there's, there are the young people would tell us there are big positives to it. So we need to be addressing and counteracting those, those sorts of things as well. But it needs to be community specific and it needs to start from a really, really young age. One thing that, you know, gleaned from the report that was published by the Muslim Women's Network UK was obviously, and, and to be seen across the board, is that obviously the sexual abuse of girls, young women, is, is, is a criminal issue, not a cultural one. But I guess, Nazmin, where would you see that the gaps are in, in getting the help to those who need it most? Well, I think something that, something that John has just mentioned, um, needing better awareness, that is, for me, one of the crucial aspects of trying to tackle sexual exploitation of young girls. And by that, it's not just better awareness for the children and for the young girls to understand, um, relate better relationships and understand, you know, right and wrong and protect themselves, but also better awareness for everybody involved. So um, previously, John mentioned teachers and that they're not equipped to be able to discuss these issues. But for me, it's actually gone further than that. Teachers aren't necessarily equipped to spot the signs either. Uh, for example, we had a case study of a young girl who was truanting from school. Now, the reason for that was actually difficulties at home, which was related to her being potentially forced into a forced marriage. And that's why she was unhappy. She was, didn't want to come into school either. Other gang mem a gang and other members of the gang found, this about, found out that, you know, this girl was unhappy. She was alone. She was a truant from school. And then that drew, they befriended her and be became friends with her and drew her into the gang. Now, Teachers that knew about her truanting just and then saw her become involved in gangs just had essentially written her off. I guess um, that'd be the term to use. That the written her off is just a lost cause. That you know, oh, she's just a child who doesn't care about education. She doesn't need anything. Not ever considering that maybe there's other reasons for it. Maybe there's a reason why she's not coming to school, and maybe there's a reason why she's been drawn into this gang and she's um, spending so much time with them. And for, for me as well, again better awareness of what other organizations see when they see these gangs. So um, what I should said about this is difference now between a girl gang and being affiliated to a girl gang. We've had cases where police officers have actually come across um, girls in gangs, seen them and just assume that, oh, they're part of the gang in the sense that, you know, they're, they're willingly and they know exactly what they're doing, not ever considering that maybe there are exploitation who are trying to get out of it they're actually trying to find a way to get out of it but they don't know how to but for reasons that everyone's mentioned because they know that if anything comes out <coughs> then they might be a victim of honor based violence from their own family um that the whole issue of shame and honor is there so definitely what we need is better awareness but better awareness on a what much